In a dramatic show of air power, the U.S. Air Force's Hill Air Force Base just sortied 52 F-35A fighter bombers. The jets massed on the runway and then took off one after the other into a clear Utah sky. The Air Force claims the timing of the exercise as the U.S. enters a new crisis with Iran is purely coincidental, and the exercise was planned months in advance. The exercise took place at Hill Air Force Base in Utah. Hill was the first Air Force base to become fully operational with the F-16 Fighting Falcon more than 30 years ago, and history is repeating itself with the F-35A. Hill is home to the only four combat-capable F-35A squadrons in the U.S. Air Force, split between the active duty 388th Fighter Wing and the reserve 419th Fighter Wing. After launch, 24 of the jets were refueled in midair by KC-135 Stratotankers. The Hill Air Force Base received the last of 78 F-35As in December 2019. To commemorate the occasion, the base decided to conduct what the U.S. military calls an elephant walk, a mass sortie of aircraft. The walk starts with a surge of fighters from their hangars, then all of the planes are launched into the air one after the other. According to the base, currently the wings fly 30 to 60 sorties per day from Hill's flight line. During the exercise, airmen launched roughly the same number of daily sorties, but they took off in quick intervals. Elephant walks are a show of force, demonstrating the might and power of the U.S. Air Force. They're also expensive. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter cost $44,000 an hour to fly, far more than its predecessor, the F-16. If each aircraft involved in the exercise flew for approximately two hours, that's a combined operating cost of $4.5 million. For the cost of 17 exercises, the Air Force could buy a brand new F-35A. The service and manufacturer Lockheed Martin are struggling to get the cost per hour down, which left unchecked could force the Pentagon to buy fewer planes. That having been said, the Air Force does get something out of the exercise. The entire base trains for the event, giving pilots and maintainers a fixed date to get a large number of jets ready to take to the skies. Once the planes are ready, the base must work to launch and recover 52 fighter jets. It's not a war scenario, but is one that exercises virtually the entire base's muscles. In an announcement, Hill Air Force Base stated, launching aircraft from multiple squadrons simultaneously presents various challenges and allows the wings to evaluate the capabilities of maintenance professionals as well as pilots and command and control teams. The elephant walk is also evidence the F-35 is growing easier to maintain. In 2018, as Air Force Magazine points out, the F-35 had a reliability rate of 66%. By late last year, the reliability rate had risen to 75%. According to the base, the 34th Fighter Squadron is currently flying in the Middle East. That means a very high number, likely higher than 75% of remaining F-35As were able to take part in the exercise, an encouraging sign for a fighter plane that's seen more than a decade of controversy.
Hank's always got his tool belt with him. Now Hank is living with prostate cancer. He still knows how to...
right now. I've got a, I'm sure he remembers it, but I've got a, a video at home of a, of a demonstration he did at Clark Air Force Base in 1960 in an Indonesian uh, F-86, the most beautiful thing I think I've ever seen. I've, I know I've watched it at least 100 times, and uh, to think that I'd be personal friends with a guy like Dale Snodgrass after I've watched him for years is, is something that's just a real honor for me. Um, so, I mean, these guys, it's just, it's just a real, it's more than I can describe to be here with these guys. Anyway, um, I, I'm like a lot of people that uh, grew up in my era. I was a little too young to, to fly the F-86, and sometimes I, I regret that. But it was an airplane I grew up with, um, built models of whenever I was a child. Uh, always thought it was the prettiest airplane. Still do think it's just the... It's just what a jet airplane should look like, and it's just beautiful. And, and I just I got to see it fly this morning from the ground the first time I'd ever did, did that when Dale flew it in a, a photo shoot. Uh, but it's it's everything I ever thought it would be. I thought maybe one day I'd get to touch one. If anybody could ever told me I'd ever own one, I would have just said no. That's not the way it is. But but uh, God's blessed me in a lot of ways, and and uh, I'm just thankful that I'm able to own and fly an airplane like this. It has so much history. Um, the airplane, I'll, instead of taking time, I'll get to the airplane, but the airplane, uh, uh, this airplane has a tremendous amount of history to it. it. It was originally made in Canada. It's a Canada Air Mark VI. This one has the, the big engine in it. The American version had 5,200 pounds of thrust. This one has 7,400 pounds, so it's about a 50% more power than the uh, American version which makes it really a lot of fun to fly. Um, I didn't really realize all the history it had when I bought the airplane. I saw it advertised for sale, and, and it was a flight systems airplane. Uh, and those of you who don't know the history of flight systems, the company itself has a lot of history with F-86s. They did a lot of top secret uh, chase maneuvers. Bob Laidlaw uh, picked this airplane out of out of a bunch of parts that they had, and then put all new air parts on it, built it, and it was his personal airplane. And he flew. He was a test pilot with North American, and he later on Flight Systems. And during its tenure with Flight Systems, it was a dart tow aircraft, which we've got a picture here of it towing a, a large dart. And what they had, they had a reel. When I bought the airplane, it had a reel back behind it, and a cable where they would pull out a. They would let release this dart and go out with a 1,200 foot cable go into a 4G turn with the airplane and whip it around in a, in a real big circle and the F-15s would shoot at it. But anyway, it was uh, just briefly, the airplane was a, uh, it was a chase plane on the B-58 Hustler program. It was a, a chase plane on some of the scramjet uh, development. It was a chase plane on the Redstone missile. Uh, the Cessna Titation, the Canada Air Challenger, and a lot of other things that, that uh, Bob Laidlaw did with it. It was uh, moved in, uh, it was used in a couple of movies, and I've been told Bob can probably tell you about it, but I've been told that Bob flew the airplane whenever Bob Laidlaw had it, whenever it was uh, with flight systems and flight systems livery. Um, the other thing that's really unique about the airplane, it's just a real honor for me to be able to correspond with Colonel James Kastler. Um, Colonel James Kastler is the most highly decorated airman in U.S. history. He was in the Hanoi Hilton for seven years with James Stock, about an incredible American. And uh, Colonel Kastler started as a B-29 uh, tail gunner in World War II, and he went on to become an ace in Korea flying the F-86. And bet between that and his time in Vietnam, he went to Canada as, as an exchange instructor, and he flew this airplane. This airplane was his personal airplane in Canada when he flew in Canada. And there was all, all along there's been questions about, well, people say that he bellied this airplane in, they had a problem with it, and bellied this airplane in. And, uh, but in Canada, but there's no record of it. And then people say, well, it was it was done at squadron level because he had a big career ahead of him and nobody wanted to tarnish that career. So there's all kind of accounts that it happened, but nobody ever knew for sure that it happened. So when I started corresponding with Colonel Kasser, a couple people says, I says, I'd like to ask him. And so he says, well, you know, you don't do that, don't embarrass. I said, I'm gonna ask him. 
So I asked him, and, and Colonel Castor wrote me a, a very humorous letter about this and confirmed, yes, he did belly this airplane in. And briefly, he took off into an 800-foot overcast. He went above it, got to 20,000 feet. The airplane sputtered and quit. And then he, and when it sputtered and quit, he headed for the ocean to bail out of the airplane. And on the way there, the, the overcast, it came up to about 5,000 feet, and he saw a big hole, and it was drizzling rain underneath. He saw a road in, in the hole. So he went down through the hole to land on the road. He saw there was power lines on both sides of the road. So he said he had to pick somewhere else. So he started looking around, and there was, there was lakes all over the place. He found a long, flat clearing between two lakes. So he put it down in the clear, and he said that the landing was so smooth he never heard, he never felt it hit the ground. But he said when he was looked at the lake in front of him, he said that the lake started to disappear, and he knew there was a huge drop off at the end of this thing next to the lake. So he said he started standing on the brakes, and then he realized in all of his excitement he never put the gear down. He was sliding along on the tank, so he was along for the ride. And he said it stopped about 20 feet from the drop off, and he got out. And he said that he everything was on. He was on radio, and, and they had him on radar. So his his account was that they knew exactly where he was, including his frustration with Canadian airplanes. So they came, picked the airplane up, picked him up, and he said the first thing they did was cheer him out because he didn't bail out of the airplane. They later thanked him and had a party because he saved the airplane. They found out it was some faulty wiring with uh, with the. Uh, fuel pumps, had it back flying in a week. So it's it's just really neat to be able to fly an airplane, put your hand on an airplane that that these gentlemen have flown. And now Dale flew it last week at Terra Hall in the Heritage flight and it's in the flew it this morning. It's just a real honor to be with these guys. And the neat thing about the airplane is just meeting all kinds of people that, that flew this airplane. And you see tears in their eyes when you, they see it fly and they come over. I was at Joplin, Missouri at the end of June and a gentleman walks over. I've seen the picture a hundred times where Pete Fernandez, the second highest ace in, in Korea, was sitting in an airplane and a young kid was handling him the helmet. Guy comes up and walks up and shows me this black and white picture, and he says, "Have you seen this before?" And I said, "Yeah, I've seen it a hundred times." And so he says, "Do you recognize anything?" And I, and I looked at it and I says, "No, what am I looking at?" And he says, "Look at me. Do you recognize anything?" And, and he was, the gentleman had years on him, but I says, "My God, it's you!" And he says, "I was 17 years old when I was handing him that helmet." And he had this cap off, which was from the fourth fighter interceptor wing in, in Korea. And he gave me the cap and says, I want you to have it. So that's, that's the thing that's really neat about this airplane. And it's just, it's just incredible. We've, we've got it painted like Colonel Robert Rowland's airplane. We wanted to pay homage to an era that's really kind of forgotten, where they were, deploying they were authorized to deploy nuclear weapons during the Cold War. And we've met another gentleman. We got a letter from him that we met at Sun and Fun, Major Norm Connett, who just flipped out when he saw the airplane. He says, I've flown this airplane just the way it's painted. Gave me the whole account, put it down in a letter where he, he flew it across the, the ocean. And it's just incredible. You know, we've we met another gentleman today who's on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We got a picture of the people standing in front of the airplane. He says, that's me in that picture. And he was he was later a commander with the Thunderbirds. He's on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of the Air Force today. And that's the thing that's incredible about it. It's just it's just a dream come true for me. And I'm I'm gonna turn it over to Sam because I want to listen to what Bob has to say, but I thank you for, for your patience and your time. Uh, uh, I'm sure that all you folks noticed this uh, handsome gentleman that just joined, came up and introduced himself to uh, to Bob Hoover. Well, he didn't introduce him. This is General Robert Olds, and he'll be here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We'd like all for you to come back tomorrow. Also, we didn't mention it at the start of the program, but in the red tent that's right behind you, we have some books and other uh, items for sale. Uh, we've got Bob Hoover's book, which if you hadn't read it, you should be ashamed of yourself. It's a great book. And uh, he'll be to sign some autographs there. He has to leave here at 2.20, so be sure and buy it and get it up there quick. And if you don't buy it, we'll find out where you are and we'll make sure you buy it. Without further ado, I want to give this to Bob Hoover, and let me just say a little bit about what I know about Bob Hoover. Bob Hoover, solo when he was 16 years old, I think he bought his time a quarter of an hour at a time over a year till he soloed. <laughs> Must be by an airport. 
He also taught himself acrobatics from a book. Uh, it's just kind of hard to imagine when you see his uh, acrobatic maneuvers that he did that. He was described by General Yeager as the greatest pilot I ever saw. That was a quote. And also, General Doolittle said, Bob Hoover is the greatest stick and rudder pilot who ever lived. Without further ado, Bob. Thank you, Sam. Wyatt, we're all proud of you for having this beautiful airplane restored as it is. This is Dale Snodgrass, one of the finest F-14 pilots I've ever met. And his commanding officer during the Gulf War told me that he was flying around the clock right at, at the time before he had to go home. He said he couldn't keep him out of the cockpit. He's the kind of fellow that I admire and respect like the gentleman next to him. Robin Olds is one of the greatest heroes you'll ever meet. He got an awful lot of kills, and he would have had a dozen more over in Vietnam. However, if he got his fifth kill, they would send him home. And so he stayed on and flew gosh knows how many more missions. Robin, I'm proud of you, and Dale, I'm so proud of you. I started out on the F-86 program, and uh, I, I was there, I, the chase pilot, as a matter of fact, on the very first flight. And that was, a, I, th I think, about the 1st of October, 47. And on the first flight of the airplane, George Welch was flying it, and he went through about a 30-minute flight, and I was with him as his chase pilot in a P-80. And I, when he gave the countdown, I came behind him and stayed with him right from takeoff and through the landing. And everything was normal until he put the gear down, and the nose gear would not extend. It was about 45 degrees. And I said, George, it's no big deal. I said, I've, I've lost the nose gear on some airplanes, and you don't do too much damage. In this case, I don't think you'd have to worry about the engine getting damaged at all. And the people in the control room at North American said, Welch, you're not working for the Air Force. Right now, you're our test pilot, and you don't listen to anybody else. We're telling you what to do. We want you to belly the airplane in. I said, if you belly the airplane in, you're going to set the program back. And I told George, I said, George, please listen to me. The engineering came back on and said, do as we tell you to do. And on the final approach, I was right with him. He was set up for his belly landing on the lake bed at Miroc. And I said, George, just listen to me. You can't possibly get hurt. Put the gear down. And so at the last minute, he put the gear down. Main gear came down and locked. And I said, now, when you touch down, pull up the flaps and hit the speed brakes because the flaps make the nose want to go down. And I wanted to get up, and the dive brakes have a pitch-up tendency, so I wanted everything going for him. And I said, just hold it off, hold it off, hold it off. And I was just landing right alongside him at the same speed. And I said, it looks to me like your nose gear is extending a little bit more, just keep the stick all the way in your gut. And he did, and that gear came out and locked before it touched. <laughs> well, you can see I've had a long association with this sweetheart. Through the program, uh, we ran into some interesting situations. The airplane originally had boosted flight controls, and we found the boosted flight controls to be inadequate to provide the data necessary to satisfy the contract, which meant 7.33 Gs at 650 knots, and we'd have to go up above 700 because when we start pulling out, the airspeed would bleed off, and we didn't have enough stick force 
to get 7.33 G. So then we got smart and decided that if we got way up in speed and we got up to about 740, uh, this was miles an hour, not knots, that if we got the pull going and then hit the speed brakes at the same time, we could pull it out. But of course, the airspeed was dropping off rapidly. But we finally found out and figured out a way to make it go to 7.33 G and still have our data point on speed. Well, that taught us a lot. It told us that we needed a different type of flight control system. And we built a lot of those A-model airplanes, and they had slats that were actuated by the pilot. You take off and get into flight, the, flaps, the, the leading edge slats were out. And then once you get your speed up, the slats could float back into place. No more aerodynamic lift from them. And then you had a big handle over here on the right side of the cockpit. You'd pull that and lock it. And then when you'd get ready to slow down, you'd unlock it and just reverse. So we put a different type of slat on it. And the first slats did not have side rollers. I'll show you what I'm talking about. When I do that, if that slat were like it, like the old ones, it would rack because it didn't have side rollers. And so there was a possibility one slat, part of the slat could come out and the other part wouldn't. And I was doing spins at very low altitude to demonstrate that we didn't have a problem, and yet the Air Force were losing F-86s because they couldn't recover from a spin. And one day I was flying at uh, demonstrating the F-86 at, at a fighter base, and the performance I would use for the demonstration would be a max speed pass, pull into an element, go right into the next element, and at the top of that M1, I'd be about 10,000 feet above the ground and roll it right side up and, and boot uh, controls to it to put it into the spin. I'd do a five-turn spin and then recover and, and land. Well, I'd, I'd done that hundreds and hundreds of times. And there'd been probably 25 or so airplanes lost. Many of the pilots were able to eject, but many were killed. And so on this particular flight, as soon as I put it in the spin, I knew something was wrong. It really wrapped up fast. And I looked out one side, and its slats were okay. I looked at the other side, and they were racked. And boy, I'll tell you, I, I couldn't see that I was going to be able to get out. I decided I'd put full throttle to it. So I did, and after about the fourth turn, it started getting up enough speed to start flying again. And uh, I immediately got on the phone when I got on the ground and called up Smokey Caldero, and I'm sure Robin remembers that name. He was head of flight safety, two stars. And I said, Smokey, have your people go through all of the accident reports and clear the pilots' names because they'd all been given pilot error. I said, they legitimately had a problem. So we redesigned and then put in these side rollers and everything was just great until the Korean War came along. Just, just before the Korean War, the, the pilots were dropping so many tanks, rightfully so, you have to throw the tanks away when you get engaged in combat. As soon as the tanks were empty, well, then you were ready to fight. So what we were trying to do to save the logistic problem of getting all of those tanks shipped over, they were so bucky, and uh, we had, there were three different companies building external fuel tanks for the F-86. And so I had the project to see how the airplane would fly without slats at all. And so what they did, they redesigned the wing, and here at the leading, ed at leading edge at the fuselage, it was extended. It's called a three, a three by six or six by three. Do you remember, three. Roman? Six three, six three leading edge. And it, uh, 
they put a fence on it like the Meg 15. They put a fence, and this is an interesting thing from an engineering viewpoint. The very first location that they put that fence, a fence is just a, a sheet of metal that goes up like this, and it stops the span-wise flow on the wing, and it keeps the airflow going back over the wing straight. Now, after we got that first flight off, they decided that maybe there was a more efficient location to put the fence, or maybe more fences. It wasn't, we tried it all up and down the wing, and that first flight was right where it should have been. Only problem with the whole thing was, one day, we thought it was 25, not, uh, 20, by this time we'd switched the knots, and we thought it was 25 knots faster than the airplane with the slats. And then one day I said, uh, why don't you, to one of my friends who's pulling another test flight on the 86, I said, why don't you get with me in formation and let's open the throttles and see how much faster this airplane is. This uh, friend of mine, Joe Lynch, was a test pilot with me and was later killed in an F-86, as a matter of fact, but uh, he said, I said, okay, let's go full throttle. That's worth stopping for. We found out that we weren't any faster. Guess why? The pedo boom. <laughs> Where is it? Yeah, here it is, over here. The, the pedo boom's got the red flag on it. Uh, instead of increase, uh, to get an accurate reading on your airspeed indicator, you have to have that boom extended 50% of the cord. Well, when we change the, the length of the wing, or the cord of the wing, to extend the boom an inch and a half to keep it out in undisturbed air. And so therefore we got a higher indicated reading and then we realized that we hadn't accomplished anything with that leading edge except the plan was we'd get rid of external tanks and fill up that leading edge and it would hold 70 gallons on each side. never did use the leading edges for fuel. We developed it for that purpose, however. And then we had to prove that uh, the airplane did have a high, high altitude capability that was perhaps a little bit better than the slatted wing. And uh, I talked to the Air Force about it and uh, they said, we got everybody going with it and let's uh, just stick with it and uh, don't worry about it. And I kept playing with the airplane, and one day I thought, I wonder what it would be like, the stall wasn't very difficult, much different, hardly any difference at all. I thought, what if I over-rotated, how would, it, would the airplane respond as it does with slats? Well, the answer is no. I had a lake bed to, to try this on 11 miles, and I took off and got up to almost a normal takeoff speed and I rotated. And instead of dropping the nose, 
I held on to the controls and started up uphill. The airplane just gradually stalled out and cushioned back in, and the airplane will fly right off. Well, we lost. Before I could brief, we started losing airplanes real quick over there. And uh, I was briefing at uh, oh, the forward air base up there. I can't remember where it was now, but nevertheless, I came out of the theater where I'd been briefing everybody except those pilots on alert. They took off, and one of them over-rotated. He had not heard my briefing. He, he went right into a, a group of people, Americans, who were extending the runway, and it cost him his life and I think four others on the ground. It was a pretty sad day for all of us. And we could see the smoke plume just as we walked out the door. Uh, at another base, uh, I think it was K-55, I went there, and uh, General Barkas had said to me when I came in to, to brief him on what I was going to be doing over there, and he said, uh, and he used to be a, a group commander on F-86s, and he said, General, you've got a different breed of cat. This fellow's one of us. He said, I think you've asked him to do, told him the wrong thing because you're going to have a, a heck of a time keeping him out of the cockpit. <laughs> so at K-55, I briefed him on a dive bombing technique that we had developed. And uh, it, it really worked. And before I went over, they, the top people in the Pentagon came out to see me demonstrate how accurate I could hit the target. And it was just amazing. I won't bore you because it's pretty technical, but I got over and I, first thing that happened, I was in the officers club with Frank Perigo. I don't know if you knew him, Robin, but uh, a great gentleman and uh, had been a friend of mine for a long time. And Frank uh, took me into the officers club and we were sit sitting at the bar and I heard some lieutenant say, what does that old geezer know about flying? <laughs> and I overheard him. And so I turned to the bartender and I said, bartender, drinks were only about 10 cents a piece. I said, bartender, set up a drink for everybody in the club. And so he started working on the drinks and got them all fixed up. And I said, and by the way, give me three shots of straight booze right here and a glass of water. And so, if when everybody got a drink, I said, here's a toast to the fighter pilots. Got all three of them down, took a sip of water. A few minutes went by and I excused myself and went to the men's room, stuck my finger down my throat, got rid of that gin, <laughs> came back to the bar and the, the other fellas in the, in the club had about a half a drink left, and I said, boy, I don't think they make fighter pilots like I used to know them. I said, uh, you fellas aren't drinking up. I said, bartender, set them all up for another drink and bring me three more. <laughs> well, the next morning I went on this first mission, and uh, I was the only one that wasn't hungover, but I did have a sore throat. <laughs> Well, Marty Martin, uh, who was a dear close friend of uh, Robbins, he was the flight leader as a colonel, and uh, he briefed everybody. There were 16 of us going on this mission. We were loaded up with bombs, uh, two 1,000-pound bombs plus the external tanks. And uh, he was leading, and I was number two. But during the briefing, he said, uh, yeah, the bridge is gone. And I thought, oh boy, I know I hit that bridge. <laughs> we got in formation, and guess what? Marty had an electrical system problem, he still had both bombs. <laughs>
Well, now those young men that were talking about the bar, what does he know? They listen. <laughs> they really listen. Well, that's part of the saga of the F-86. Uh, I never had any real problems uh, in my testing, and I did uh, asymmetric loads externally on the spin test, and I did the spin test uh, on several models of the airplane. Uh, it was just a sweetheart to fly, and we got all the bugs out of it eventually, and it was the most forgiving, fun flying airplane I've ever had. And I bet I can ask Robin or Dale, and they'll say the same thing. Just an honest airplane. Bob, will you uh, tell a little bit about the uh, takeoff that you took out of LAX where you had the control surface problems? I mean, well, I would, that, that to me would be problems. I, you say you haven't had any problems, but... Well, it, it, as I mentioned earlier, our concern was being able to pull high G uh, to maneuver the airplane to get in a position to, to make a kill. And uh, the engineering came up with an idea, and it was an early one. Uh, up till this time, we only had boosted controls. And they gave us a design called an irreversible control system. And what it amounted to was that you holding onto the stick did not really connect you with any of the control surfaces. They were actuated by your input. And I call it like flying a potentiometer with pressure. And it, and it had spring bungees because the biggest problem we had was making it feel normal or conventional to the average fighter pilot who was flying the airplane. And we did that with this artificial system. Well, I had flown the airplane a couple of times and it seemed just normal to me. And on this particular test flight, I took off out of LAX on 2-5 left. And as soon as I rotated, I hit the gear up only with this hand and uh, as soon as that gear hit the wells, the nose pitched up. My horizontal surfaces were no longer attached to the system, and they were free-floating. And the airplane pitched straight up, and I did have a rudder. And it, it, it rolled off at about, oh, I'd say a thousand feet or so is where it, it stalled on me and the nose dropped, and I thought it was going to start spinning. I stood on the rudder, and I thought, well, it's going to be a real bang here. And it came down, and without any control, it just cushioned out, and I guess it was about 100 feet above the runway. And then it went over the top of the hangar just barely, and it started up again. And this time I got smart. I thought, I'll pull the throttle back before it stalls, and then the nose will drop, and I can rudder it back level and uh, add the power back on. And I, I was successful in gaining about three or 400 feet on every pull-up. And uh, just because of instinct, I knew the system, but I just ripped my thumb and index finger right through here from trying to push on it. It was like in concrete. And I even got my knees behind it, still thinking that it was the old system, but didn't do any good, of course. So then I started getting more clever. For those, those of you who are not pilots or, or have never really studied aerodynamics, the reason we have a big tail back there is to balance out the loads during some parts of your flight. You have a load that's on the, on the bottom surface pushing the tail up. And on other phases of your flight, as a, a pressure, aerodynamic pressure, it's just like shifting weight from one end to the other, you have pressure on the top. And I thought, if I can just find, and I called it a sweet spot, if by using the dive brakes, the landing gear, and the flaps, and the throttle, if I can find that sweet spot where there's no pressure either on the top or the bottom of those surfaces back there, that maybe I could hold that. Of course, everybody was screaming and yelling from the very instant it happened to get out, get out, get out. Well, this was one of a kind. We built 
thousands of F-86s with that system, and this airplane has it. Honest to goodness, you have never ridden through a smoother landing than that landing. Those swept wings here, they got into ground effect, and it cushioned the airplane out. I guess it was pretty flat by then. And as soon as I got into ground effect, it just eased right down. It was like landing on a wet runway. It was the smoothest landing I've ever ridden through. But it did roll 11 miles. <laughs> I rolled right up to the base operations there at the old Edwards base, and Jack Ridley came out to meet me. He was on the X-1 program with, with uh, Chuck Yeager and myself, and, uh, and uh, Jack said, boy, Bob, he said, that was the hairiest ride I've ever heard about. And I said, yeah, Jack, you want to feel something interesting? Look at this. Nothing happens. It's, I've got a stick in concrete. He said, my gosh. Well. We took a look at it, and because of that, we found out what was wrong, and it was stray voltage that was common to both the normal flight control system and the alternate flight control system. We corrected it, and the rest is history. It turned out to be a great airplane with a lot of capability. You know, I had invited uh, my friend Dick Rutan here to come over because I thought I was going to be talking about the F-100, and I, I wanted to, uh, the thing I had in my mind at the time was to, sh to talk to you about the, the development of an airplane from the drawing board until its demise. And I asked Dick if, if he would join me because had I talked about that subject, I wanted him to share with you. Uh, Dick flew more combat hours in twice. And there, as Oliver North said, there is a real hero. Uh, he was in there saving people's lives right and left. And uh, I'd just like to, to introduce you, even though we aren't talking about the F-100, Dick. Bob asked me to come over for a little while because he was the one that, that did the initial flight test development of the airplane. And I'm kind of on the... And all of you know Robin's background. Robin, Robin said he'd like to, to make a little comment, if you don't mind. Please, Robin. I met Bob Hoover in Cleveland. Cleveland Air raised his first lieutenant. Not working. Now, Barrio. Hello, can you hear this? I understand Bob Hoover was first assigned to uh, be the one to break the sound barrier, but uh, Chuck Yeager takes that uh, privilege. I wonder what, what happened and why. Bob, the question was, is uh, he understands that, uh, which is true, that you were the number one choice for the X-1 program but that uh, you ended up being number two, and Chuck took over that. He wanted to know what, what happened. <laughs> yeah, you bet. I was flying uh, the, the, the P-59 P and P-80s, our first jets, and I had uh, already evaluated uh, the German Heinkel 162, and I was selected for the X-1 program out of a pyramid of candidates. And uh, a fellow by the name of Pete Everest, who was not flying jets, one morning walked into the ready room and he said, uh, wonder if you'd be kind enough to pull a buzz job down at the Springfield Airport and I'll tell everybody it was me. He said, I've talked when I should have been listening and told him I was flying jets. And I said, well, Pete, I'd be delighted to do it, but every test flight I have, I'm always out of fuel by the time I head back to, to land. And I said, if I have a, a test card that leaves me with a little fuel, I'll go down and, and buzz the Springfield Airport for you. And so one day I had such a condition where I, I had enough fuel to do it, and I went across upside down. And I was down low, and I came over and landed at right field. 
And I had already been selected for the program, and uh, uh, Chuck wasn't involved in it at all at that time. And months went by, and Al Boyd took over flight tests, and he called me into his office, and he said, young man, did you buzz the Springfield Airport on such and such a date? And I said, yes, sir, I certainly did. And he, he said, well, I know two things about you. You're honest, because there was only one jet that flew in the whole United States that day. But he said, I also know that you're irresponsible. And I don't know who I'm going to get, I'm going to select to be the number one pilot. But you've been studying this for so long, you're going to be his number two. Well, I was now just dreading to hear whom that second person might be, because some of the candidates in that pyramid were pilots whose flying abilities I did not respect. And I think it would have been a, a tough thing for me to take uh, with somebody that I didn't feel was qualified to do it. And one day he called me in and he said, uh, uh, do you know a, a Captain Chuck Yeager? And I said, yes, sir. He said, that's who I've selected. And I could hardly contain myself because the first time I met Chuck, I, was, I balanced him. And uh, we got into a hassle. And finally, we'd worked ourselves down from about 15,000 feet to the deck. And he came up. Neither one of us could get the advantage on the other. So we were just half sides of the circle. And he said, fella, I don't know who you are, but we better break it off before we kill ourselves. <laughs> and so I came in and landed, and I didn't know who he was or who it was. I jumped. And he walked over to the airplane and introduced himself. And then I, we both had respect for one another. And we dog fought with all of the captured, uh, not all of them, but many of the captured German and Japanese airplanes against our airplanes. Uh, evaluating them, and I admired him more and more each day that I had uh, flown with him uh, prior to his selection. So you can see I was absolutely elated and delighted that I'd be working with somebody I could admire and respect, and by this time we'd become good friends. Next question. Okay, uh, Bob, if you'll go over to the tent over here, we'll proceed with uh, selling all your books. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Dale. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each 
with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt Me-262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras, and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage, and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.